All right, welcome everyone. Welcome back. Matt is here with us. I'm here. Welcome, Matt. Matt actually fits in um, working working with us on these continuing eds between his very, very busy class schedule, that's right? That's right, that's right, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Yes, it is. It's worth it. Why is it worth it, Matt? I learn a lot. <laughs> I'm Get learning while teaching, and AJ does a great job here. So yes, thank you. Well, do, do you learn things here that you aren't learning in your business classes? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's amazing. That yeah, is. Okay. It's too bad you can't get college credit for this. That, there's a competitive advantage. That is a com that's a competitive advantage. That's <laughs> exactly right about that. All right, today, today for this particular uh, infographic and continuing ed series, we're going to be talking about things that are beyond the five data points, right? right? Mm -hmm. And specifically, we're going to be talking about how to value REO assets. That's right. What does REO stand for, Matt? Uh, it's bank owned properties. Bank owned properties. And do you know what the letters stand for? <laughs> um, See, they don't teach this stuff in business school, but we teach it here. Right, right. That's right. Real estate owned. Ah, real estate owned. Okay. Yes, and the, where, the place the term comes from is actually banks' balance sheets mm -hmm. have specific standardized classifications, specific standardized terminology, nomenclature, whatever you want to call it, yes. right? And REO is, stands for real estate owned, meaning real estate owned by the bank or financial institution. And it is a universal terminology, like so many of the terminologies on the bank balance sheets, right? And if right. you look at FDIC reports like we teach you to, you will recognize that the, uh, that the, the terms for these financial reporting numbers are standard across all banks because all of these banks are reporting to the FDIC. Right. And if they aren't, well, that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's a whole other con right. continuing education that Sal will have to teach. That's beyond me. <laughs> but anyway, so shall we dive in? Let's dive in. Let's dive in. Okay. So first up, what perspective are we teaching this entire infographic from? What perspective? So an asset agnostic perspective. Well, asset agnostic. Yes. Matt, what does that mean? So no particular asset in general, just covering a, a wide variety of assets. So that means that we could be talking about multifamily. That's right. We could be talking about a pool of single family residential. That's right. We could be talking about a hotel. Yes. We could be talking about a warehouse. Right. We could be talking about um, office space, mm -hmm. right? All of our food groups. That's right. Okay, asset agnostic. And it's a fun word to say. It is a fun so. word to say. It is. Okay, it is. very good. All right, but all, but so even though we're, we're being asset agnostic with this, we're all talking about in the context of, of real estate owned, right. right? Something that's owned by the bank. Right. Right, there's your opportunity. The bank owns it. What do you do with it? All right, so here we go. So you'll notice that uh, on your infographic, the first is likely scenarios, this orange column here. Mm-hmm. So the first asset is, what's the first asset? Commercial REO and value added, right? Right. Okay. So <clears throat> the likely scenario here is that the bank has no financial records and is not managing the asset. Okay. So let's think about this. We're being asset agnostic here, right? Right. So we could be talking about multifamily or office or warehouse, right? All right. So I ha I, I evaluate multifamily every day, right. right? I happen to own multifamily, although Sal does not condone this. <laughs> right? I do. I, I did before I came here, and I and I've managed it for many years, so I know what's involved. Mm -hmm. And you have to have good financial records, That's right? Right. Otherwise, you don't understand how it's performing. You don't know what the NOI is. You don't know what the historical performance is. Okay. Banks have not been in the, in the business of managing um, income producing commercial assets, right? Some right. used to say that banks were in the business of lending money. I don't think that's true anymore. <laughs> right, that's good. Okay, good but that's again another <laughs> continuing education. Right. Okay, but they're definitely, they definitely have never been in the business of managing assets, right? right? They, they believe that's the job of the sponsor. So it makes perfect sense that if they ended up owning it because they, it went through a foreclosure and now it's on their books as an REO, that they wouldn't have any financial records. That's right. So now you have a problem because if you can't value a property because you don't have the financial records, then what are you going to do? Exactly. 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 Yeah. So you have to be able to dig a little bit deeper to figure out exactly what the financial records are of the asset. Maybe they're found somewhere else. Maybe you could track down a management company that used to management. That's right. It's going to be a tricky part of the due diligence. But be aware that just because the, just because this particular bank or financial institution says, "Oh yes, we've got financial records. Show them to me." 
that's the first thing to look at. Right. You need them. You need to figure out where to get them. And every situation is going to be different. Right. That's okay. Point. Okay. And also. Um, since the bank isn't managing it, maybe the asset's vacant. Could okay, make it a little bit more difficult. Right. So. All right. Now, if it's a multifamily property and it's 500 units and all 500 are vacant, that's a bigger problem, <laughs> right? Than if we're talking about one warehouse that's yep. vacant, which is you know a warehouse in this case might be designed to have one tenant. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's vacant. They're both a problem. Right. But that's that's a different scenario. I mean, if you have 500 vacancies worth versus one vacancy, <laughs> right? Just be aware of that. So you know. Again, we're being yeah, asset agnostic here. Right. Things, exactly. to, things to look at. Okay, so and is, it's entirely possible that the bank wouldn't know that. Maybe they've never even visited the asset. Which is possible. Definitely you know, they've maybe never right. visited whatever property this is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it could even be vacant land. And maybe they have it on their books as something else. Sal has seen that happen. <laughs> okay, anyway. Just, just know what's going on when it when it comes to the bank's records. That's really very right. important. Okay, so how to value, as we would call it, the price per pound. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, obviously, we're not weighing these things. Right. Hopefully, you have a building that's stuck to the ground. That's right. Um, but uh, you know, I think that term comes from our answer of how much uh, how much does a bag of groceries weigh? Depends on what's in it. <laughs> right. Do you yeah. buy your groceries by the pound? No, you don't. <laughs> you do if it's ground beef. <laughs> right. That's right. But not if it's a can of tomatoes. Exactly. Okay, so <clears throat> check what similar assets are trading at. Of course, that, of course that's going to be called comps, but the more right. complicated the asset, the more difficult that becomes. Exactly. So it's done every day uh, for single family residential properties, right. right? But for multifamily properties, there's a lot more factors to consider. It's a little bit right. more difficult. Still can be done. It's even more difficult for warehouse and office, but it's still possible. Right. So see what they're trading at. You know, comps do matter here. Now. Exactly. The price per door or price per key, uh, these are usually terms that we talk about with multifamily or hotel, right? Price per door, I've, I've, I've heard a lot with multifamily. Right. Um, and price per key, a lot with uh, hospitality, hotel. Okay. okay. So those are just general metrics, but, okay. but <clears throat> a market is a market. It's kind of a circular definition, <laughs> right? That's right. Um, that means that y you need to look at the whole market, right. and the market is telling you what the price is. What, what this sold for last month, what one of these sold for two weeks ago, what one of these sold for last week, mm -hmm. um, is what they're selling for. And it, it might be hard to see here, but the foreclosures and the tax deed sales count. Okay, I have dealt with individuals that were trying to put a higher price on their asset, and when I looked at the comps, I said, what about this, this, and this? And, you know, the person who was wanting funding for this simply said, oh, those don't count because, um, you know, they're foreclosures, they're tax deed sales. We're here to tell you, they count. They right. matter because they're real sales, and you know they, they affect the price. That's right. They, they, because if if enough people are being able to get these at foreclosures and tax deed sales, mm -hmm. they're going to get them there instead of retail price through a realtor, right? Right. Exactly. You know, real estate agent or whatever. And we're not saying anything about them <laughs> at all. Remember, Sal married one. Oh, that's right. <laughs> So AJ, would this also be considered, would you hear it as the market value of an asset? Yes, okay. but the real market value real of an asset. Value. And, and I think that's probably the most important part I could say about this, okay. is that when you're looking at, at comparable sales for whatever the asset is, right, right, that the, you need to look at the foreclosures and okay. the tax deed sales as well. They count. Okay. Right? They may not court, but they count. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just noticed Messed that. Messed up on the end. <laughs> it, 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 it happens. It happens. Okay. Anyway, so I think I was. Uh, I, I think I was. I, I, I mentioned that. And also, you'll see in your infographic a nice little red box that says, "Pay no attention to the listed comps, appraisals, or the unpaid balance." Right on something. If it's if it's listed as part of whatever, wherever you're getting these comparables from. Don't pay attention to it because that's what somebody wants to get. Right. Right. That's not what they're really selling for. And this comes back to a market as a market. Exactly. We want the real market value, not mm -hmm. the uh, perceived market value by those aren't that aren't yeah. doing a transaction. If somebody lists something, you know, for for ten million dollars, but yeah. they've only been selling for two million dollars. Right. Are they worth ten or are they worth two? They're worth two. They're worth two. Yeah. Even though there's a bunch of listings for ten. Exactly. But those aren't being sold. Those orders are not being filled. Right. You would understand that. I would. Those. Orders 
orders are not being <laughs> filled, and therefore that's not the current price. Exactly. We'll let Matt teach that one next time. <laughs> no, anyway, so, um, and also a big, a big misconception is val valuing something that may have debt on it, mm -hmm. right? Or there may be a history of the debt, and they value it based on the unpaid balance of that of, of the debt. Well, if the debt was was set at an, at an inflated price, and and back in the day, <laughs> <laughs> when the value was one, you know as high as it's ever been and potentially overinflated, now, obviously not sustainable because it wasn't sustained. And two, um, if, if too much, too high a percentage of, the val of that overinflated value was lent, right. then of course the unpaid balance is probably going to be a little bit too high compared to the real value of the asset. Right. Ignore it. We ignore it. On the deal desk, if somebody gives me an unpaid balance of something, I'm going to tell you right <laughs> now, I ignore it. Don't send us those. Right. Um, because it doesn't matter. If you've been on the phone with Gordo, he trades pools of, of, of notes all the time, performing and non-performing notes. And of course, an unpaid balance of the note is something that he deals with, but he doesn't use it to value the property. Right. Right. He, he doesn't use it to value the asset. Very good point. He, he, I mean, it's a part of the value of the loan. He's trading loans. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but in this particular context, we're talking about the REO, so we're talking about a real asset, not a loan. REO means there's no debt, it's been cleansed. Okay. Right? Yeah. You knew that. Right. You do now. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on. So, how to bid the basis at the buy. Okay, so. Now, I, 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 we want you to keep these things in mind, whether you're buying this for your own portfolio, whether you're working with somebody else who's buying it for their own portfolio, or if you're bringing it to Dandrew. We're going we're gonna to follow these guidelines, so I suppose I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, please pay close attention to these things because these are the guidelines we go by. It's, right. it's why we're teaching you what we do when we go beyond the five data points. Because, you know, anyone who's been on the phone with me to evaluate a deal, you know that I quickly go beyond the five data points. All right. Points. Yeah, so these are very important <laughs> questions. No, they are. Find they out, are. So. Okay. So, <clears throat> treat REOs as value added. What does that mean? Yeah, I got you there. Okay, so we would call that the, um, the back of the envelope approach. So we want to take the lowest comparative market analysis and discount it by the dollar amount of repairs and then discount that by 20% because there's a certain level of inefficiency there. Okay, that is what we're talking about. We treated as value added because chances are there's some level of distress. Right. And when we go back here, and we know that the bank hasn't been managing the asset because that's definitely not their business. Right. They may or may not be in the business of lending. They may used to and not anymore, <laughs> but that's another story. But they're definitely not in the in the business of managing. So let's just assume that the bank is what Sal calls a bad operator. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not even their, they're, they're yeah, not even it's trying. Not even their job. Yeah. It's, it's not their. And so, um, you know, there are exceptions. There are exceptions, but they are exceptions. Right. And so, you know, be aware of this. Um, that's why we want you to treat them as value added because the, the very nature of them being REOs puts them in that distressed situation where something probably needs repaired because it's fallen into disrepair for lack of lack of management. Right. Uh, lack of good intensive management. Mm -hmm. All right. So CMA. When do I just love? I just love. Uh, acronyms, we don't know what they mean. In this case, we're talking about the comparative market analysis. So you want to take the lowest comparative market analysis, discount it by the dollar amount of the repairs. So you know you have to be able to know what needs to be repaired. Right. It's another level of due diligence you need to be sure you're aware of. You know, and then discount that by 20%. Because that's usually a realistic number. Right? Yeah. So Very good. Th that's gonna that's gonna factor in the fact that most rehabs cost more than estimated. They just do. <laughs> okay, so now, condoizing. I don't think we said anything. We did that. If condoizing is, is, a, is a strategy, then treat that as a rental. Okay. We have a series called Condominium Financier, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really going to defer you to that, so we're not going to go too deep into this. But, but in this event, we want you to, to treat the metric as, as if it's a, it's a rental, so there's going to be a net operating income, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be expenses, 
you have to understand how to properly calculate the net operating income and use right. that, use, use an appropriate cap rate to value that. If you want to learn more about that, then of course we're going, you're going to have to watch some of our continuing eds uh, and our education on you know, how to calculate the NOI, how right. to calculate the cap rate, so on and so forth. Okay, so the basis at buy should be treated as a rental and therefore use the comparative market analysis cap rates of recent trades to back into an NOI for a bid at a value added cap rate. Did you catch all that, Matt? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, so I'll, I'll say that again. Use the comparative market analysis cap rates. Right. right. All right. So the cap rate is is what those is is the percentage, is the ratio of the NOI to the uh, to the purchase price. Right. Right. And so that pretty much says these assets are trading at such and such a cap rate in mm -hmm. such and such an area. Right. right. If it's at such and such a class. Right. Right. C class properties usually trade at a different cap rate than A class properties, but then it also right. varies. Again, we're going to defer to our cap rate education oh, on that. Exactly. Okay. And uh, but you, you need to, you, those are. Your comps, those are your comparable numbers, the cap mm -hmm. rates, the back into a net operating income for a bid at a value added cap rate. Value added cap rate, so what does that mean? So if these things are trading at seven caps or six caps in the area, is a five cap a value added cap rate or is an eight cap a value added cap rate? Eight cap. That's right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Make sure you're going the right direction. Right. Right. But anyway, those are basics. So refer to our cap rate uh, discussion about that. Okay. So everything we talked about on this row, we were talking about how to uh, how to bid the deal, right? Right. So now we're going to talk about the sponsor. Yes. Because that matters too. Oh, it's very important. <laughs> very, very important. Okay. The sponsor and the qualifying of the asset. Mm -hmm. Sponsor and qualifying of the asset. Right. Clarify that. Okay. Location. Specifically about the asset. Right. A little bit about the sponsor, but a lot more about the asset. Right. Is it desirable or marketable? Right. Okay. So you've heard Sal talk about snake and lizard territory in the desert southwest. Oh, it's in Arizona, you know, mm -hmm. near Phoenix. Yeah, 50 miles outside of the city limits. Oh, yeah. Whoops. <laughs> hey, it's in Nevada. It must be near Las Vegas. Well, yeah, be careful with that. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the point is, um, if, if there's not a market for it, you yeah. know, you got to be aware of that. And that's, you're going to figure that out as part of your due, due diligence. Your comparative market analysis is going exactly. to tell you how many of these assets are trading uh, in this community like that. Oh, uh, again, be aware of it. It's, it's a factor. I don't think I need to belabor that point too much. Right. Okay, reference the USA Today weather map strategy. That's such a basic thing. We have a whole infographic on that, and uh, I'm not going to reteach that. But basically, the amount of attention that it gets on the USA Today, mm -hmm. the, the good old-fashioned paper newspaper that, is, believe it or not, is still around, the, um, the, the amount of emphasis that that city or community gets on that map yeah. is probably proportionate to the amount of attention you should give to it. So if it's not on there, then the location isn't particularly as good. Right. Right? Exactly. And if you're dealing with communities that aren't on there, give that special consideration. Right? It, we're, yeah. not, we're not, it, we're not uh, unable to do anything with those or teach you anything about those, but those need to have special consideration. Right. Right? We have our own special niche of dealing with assets in rural areas, and I guess I'd be pretty much in charge of that. <laughs> being, from, being from rural middle, middle America myself. Right. All right, so enough said about that. Desirability of the asset or the collateral. Moving versus storage companies. We've heard Sal say something about this. Oh, yeah. So, we're talking about the context of the sponsor here, not the seller. Okay. Uh, in the case of an REO, the bank, the financial institution is the mm -hmm. seller. So, in the context of the sponsor, are they going to hold it or are they going to quickly trade this? Right. Okay. So,. And maybe you can look at it as part of the seller as well. I'm not exactly sure where Sal was going with this, so I'm just going to cover all the bases. Isn't that great? <laughs> Isn't that great? It's a good analyst. Right <laughs> okay. Cool. So um, the bank lent on marginal assets to make fees. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I think I know where Sal was going with this because he usually talks about about banks that make loans. Are they going to move the loan? Are they going to right. package it and sell it off on Wall Street as a securitized mortgage pool? Right. 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 <laughs> Which we saw a lot. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 And yeah. and, and there there's still there's still some of those are still unwinding. Right. Um, or are they um, are they holding them on the, on their own books? You know, mm -hmm. did they originate this loan or did they buy it? Did they buy a bank that had this on their right. on their books? So on and so forth. Um, anyway, it's it's good to know it's good to know that. But if we're talking about the sponsor, how does that fit? Well, I think it also talks about going with desirability of the asset. If a bank just wants to, to lend the money and package it up and sell it off as soon as possible, it probably sells, tells you something about it. So the asset. maybe they didn't maybe they didn't do a good job valuing the asset if right. they were a moving company, maybe but they did a better job valuing the asset if they were a storage, storage company. company. Exactly. Matt's got it. There you go. Matt has got it. All right, Matt, very good. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. right. Okay, so is the asset or collateral marketable? Other factors? Well, we just talked about that. Right. Okay, but of course, now if it's being overpriced, it's not marketable. Right. Oh, look at all these that are listed for ten million dollars. Exactly. Sorry, these assets are trading for two. Oh yeah, so true. Is it something that you would want to own yourself? Yeah, I think that's a good question to ask. So, what other factors did we not put up here on this board because we don't have the room? That's a, it just said other factors. Other factors. <laughs> so really, <laughs> it's not on the infographic either. Right. right, right. <laughs> so let's, you know, that's enough. I think so. That's I think enough. We covered a lot in location, <laughs> desirability, and then we'll go to sponsor. That's enough. That All right, let's let's too. finish up with the quality of the sponsor. Okay, the quality of the sponsor that's buying the asset. We've already spoken about the quality of the sponsor that has held the asset and is selling the asset, right? Right. I think a bad is a, a bank, a financial institution is a bad operator because that's not their business, right? right? So you know. That's your opportunity. All right, but the but the individual who is buying the asset, whoever that is, you, the sponsor you're working with. I'm not going to say dander because we're financiers, we're not buyers. Right. 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 Will you risk your reputational capital if you bring he or she to the capital partner? Right. Right. In some cases, the capital partner is us. In some cases, you might be dealing with another capital partner. You might be raising your own. You might be uh, starting and organizing your own fund and raising your own capital about this, right? right? Okay, so you, then you're going to have your own capital partners and your own reputational capital with your own capital partners because mm -hmm. they believe that you are reputable enough to invest in the fund that you structured and the fund that you're now the managing director of. So are you going to risk that reputational capital because you don't really know how solid and credible the sponsor is? Right. Can I say that any better? Super important to know that. Okay. It's very important. <laughs> I've even heard Sal ask multiple times about sponsors, would you invest your life savings? Get out your wallet. Yeah, That's right. Wallet. That's would you look your question. spouse in the eye and say, honey, yeah. we're going to put our entire retirement savings into this deal with this sponsor. Oh, yeah. And we're going to trust them to manage it successfully. Right. That Can you do it? Perspective, it? It really does. And, and we want you to think of it that personally before bringing it to us, you know, or ask the critical questions. Right. You know, a few of the people watching this have, have been on, on deal calls with me where I'm, I'm deal captain of that deal, and I'm pretty hard on them. Right. I, I really am because I I, I, I treat a sponsor that unto, like the guilty until proven innocent, innocent, right? Right. And I've actually been a sponsor before, so I mean, I really know what they're thinking sometimes. Oh, yeah. I really do. So anyway, but that's that's why we're so hard on them because they really are guilty until they're proven innocent, and I think that's. That's because it is so, so important that the sponsor um, be credible, that the sponsor have the experience, you know, because they're really, they're really as much at the heart of the success or failure of the deal as the asset. Right. Because good operators make bad deals good, bad operators make good deals bad. That's right. That's it. Um, okay, crucial, are they local to the asset? Do they live in the same community or are they a thousand miles away? Right. And they're the sponsor. How are they going to oversee, how are they going to manage the management company, hoping full there is one, right. if they're that far away? Right? It's tricky. It's very tricky. It's tricky. Right. So, of course, the closer the sponsor is to the asset, the better off it is. And it's completely unacceptable, in our opinion, mm -hmm. if, if there is no management company and the sponsor is managing the asset without a management company and they're a thousand miles. <laughs> we find that How would that work? <laughs> we hope you do, too. Right. 
So, you know, if I'm ever on the phone with you, we're evaluating a deal where that's the scenario, you better be able to justify <laughs> that one because I'm going to ask some hard questions. Okay. Experience is the most important. Right. They've done this before. Is this their first rodeo? Mm -hmm. You know, what? show us a track record. You know, somebody, somebody on the sponsorship level needs to have the credibility and the history that we, we, we're, we're targeting. That's right. That's fair. Matt, did I miss anything? I think we covered it all. Fantastic. There we go. All right. Well, we're going to move on to the next layer of this infographic. So here we go. Here we go.